coffee or start to get popular, you know, popularized in our, um, in our spaces, we have to always be critical and always be looking at those things as, uh, as something that we can improve and something that we need to learn deeper about. Um, and so I really kind of started this workshop that I, that I, you know, been doing the last couple of years in an effort to learn more. And I realized kind of the depth that land acknowledgement can take when it's, when it's really investigated from a personal place, you know, and really um, invested to in, in the individual, you know, if you really do a lot of self-reflection on why it is that you want to acknowledge others and you want to acknowledge indigenous knowledges and indigenous people and indigenous work past and present, I think that you are grounded a bit more in the place that you're in um, with respect. And I think that you start to um, recontextualize some of your own histories in place. Uh, and I think that for me, this this workshop that we've been you know doing um, with Benel and now doing land acknowledgements and action through signage murals and different projects, I think that it's just like the next step forward. You know, it's it's moving from that place of okay, so we're learning what land acknowledgement is. We can think about it, you know, conceptually or say it or or write it. But what does it mean to make a land acknowledgement? You know, and and I just kind of see this project moving further and further, you know, um, in my workshop, I talk about, you know, no one's expected to do the right thing the first time. You know, I think that there's a lot of fear around performative acts of allyship and it's a real feel, fear and also a real um, a real danger to 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 live in that place, you know, if you're not constantly moving forward in your knowledge, you know, and I think that you can do that in little ways um, and through, through action, through, through the, through the gathering and painting of signs, you know, I think this last weekend, the real value in what we did was not so much the sign that we created, but uh, the community and the discussions and the people that came together, you know, um, that moment where we were all talking about this thing in that time, you know, in that place, in that space, you know, and, and really like talking about what does it mean to be thankful and what does it mean to, you know, properly acknowledge Indigenous people? Is it in language or, you know, it, in Indigenous language or is it in English, you know, is it using the place names or is it, you know, trying to make an outward sort of signal to, to every person, you know, passing by. I think that all these questions are important ones to ask. Whether we have the right answer, whatever that is or not, I think that it's all about trying and it's all about making that effort. And, you know, I'm just like very honored and glad to be able to, to guide people and, and at least with the knowledge I have in the, in the most the most correct path, you know, and I also have to thank Argent, you know, quite a bit for last week and Argent was a good, you know, help in, in language. He brought the dictionary and, and also just like another, um, I think ally in, in education and in, you know, um, being in that teaching space, which I think we all have to remember that when we're asking of others, particularly of indigenous people that being in that teaching space is, is a lot of work and a lot of emotional labor too. And, you know, the way we did it last weekend, you know, all together and just kind of like learning as we go felt really good for me. And, you know, it just felt really good to be with all of you, you know, doing that because it felt like we were learning and developing it in that moment. Thank you so much, Melissa. Each of us brings a different experience to this work, which is so valuable. And for Bunnell, our goal is to deepen local dialogue and awareness about land acknowledgement, to broaden participation and understanding, knowledge and respect for this work as collective action through very individual contributions. As part of this dialogue today, we'll share photos of the signs that were created 
and then we'll talk about where each of you envision installing them and why. And together we'll shape a path forward, one that's inclusive and um, receptive. And I appreciate what you're saying, Melissa, about taking these steps, taking small steps. That's of vital importance. Um, and, and each of us, um, we have with us, of course, Argent Kvaznikov, uh, the board president of Benel, uh, Rika Mao, Brianna Lee, and, and Debbie Poor. I'm so grateful that you could join us. And um, as we look at images of your work, I think it would be really exciting to share what draws you to this action, maybe a, a story, um, uh, the personal um, journey, perhaps a little window into it of what draws you into this work. I'm really um, open to whatever you might want to share. And I think what, um, what strikes me as, as deeply important about this human journey is that we're all um, survivors of the uh, colonial mythology of outward discovery with its um, agenda of manifest destiny and its um, strategy of exploration. And in many cases, exploitation of the land. For some of us, that's what brought us to Alaska. For others, they're survivors of that legacy. But it seems to me that the work of land acknowledgement today is really about rooting down here where we are and connecting to a deeper story that has a lot to do with self-discovery and restorative justice to the land and the people who've stewarded it since time immemorial. And as we move into um, sharing of these images, I thought maybe we could start with Melissa as our, as our fearless leader. And um, I, can, I can share the images that you've, you've offered and perhaps you could tell us where you are um, in your own uh, journey, you know, in this work. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, let's see, it's gonna pop into screen share really quick. My desktop, wherever that is, there it is. And um, did that work? No, it doesn't feel like that worked. Here we go. There we go, yeah. Um, yeah, so, I, you know, I gave you a little, a little bit of a, a lead into with some of the development of this that really, um, any, all this work started off with me just wanting to understand land acknowledgement more. Um, I had attended a conference in Canada and um, I found myself at a, you know, at a table, you know, with all at least outwardly facing like non-Indigenous um, individuals and, you know, I was there with like my notepad and like very diligently ready to like, you know, take notes and bring back to my institution. I was working at the time, you know, this, this information on this arts conference. And I found that I, I honestly couldn't even get past hearing the land acknowledgement because it just moved me and just really shook me. So, um, you know, because in that moment, I didn't realize how important it was for me to feel like I was acknowledged on like another level, you know, on a level of that I was that I was a human and that my family and everything was considered in the work of that conference of that individual who was giving the land acknowledgement, you know, and, and while it's like policy in Canada, um, you know, with truth and reconciliation to have land acknowledgements, I think that in some ways it, it meets people at the different sort of stages they are in their own sort of, um, I think, identity and development in, you know, in, in institutional, you know, um, environments, you know, uh, I heard that land acknowledgement and it made me feel uh, very, very seen and welcomed in that work. And also made me feel like in some ways I could be part of it where, I didn't even realize 
before that I felt so much of an outsider to that world that I really desperately wanted to be part of, you know, and uh, that's, I think, when I kind of realized the power land acknowledgement can have um, for people. And so I wanted to learn more about that and about how to develop that, um, you know, in, in art practice, you know, in a way that that is beyond performance ship, performance ship and um, into more actions and into more um, learning spaces, you know, ones that is welcoming to, to everyone, um, but still is guided by indigenous, you know, um, belief systems and principles. So for me, this has become like uh, creating things that that are physical, you know, um, I like physical spaces, I like to have physical conversations with people, you know, and I think the signage, the signage project has just been sort of a, a manifestation of that, you know, um, when I was quite young, I, I was uh, given the name by the elder um, little teacher. And uh, I think that in some ways that kind of like shaped my whole sort of way of being, you know, it's like, I've, I've always been trying to, to figure out like, what kind of artist am I going to be? What kind of person am I going to be? You know, what, what, what is going to sort of define me as, as an individual? And I think that it's been this sort of um, journey of trying to understand and trying to learn, but also trying to teach people because I, because I think that that's a, the other side of teaching is that you're you're really just a very curious person, you know, trying to understand things deeper and deeper and on a, on another level. And um, I think that's that's been you know why why I've I've been on this you know train for so long is because I. I I do see that it has so many layers and I think that we all can benefit from them, you know, because at, at its core, it, it holds so many, uh, I think important Athabascan values that while they're Athabascan, while they're Diné, I think that um, our whole world can benefit from them and transparently recognizing and acknowledging people is a very much a potlatch, you know, very much a ceremonial um, part of Diné culture. And I think that it can it can really um, build bridges for people when you recognize them transparently, publicly, um, and and with understanding. So I think you got to go the other way, Asia. I think the other the other ones are before. I, I I must have put them in a little bit out of order because we're jumping into. You think so? You think I think it's at the very front. Yeah, right. You're really so right. There we go. Yeah. Yeah, so this so this is actually a um, an image that I um, I completed for the Girdwood Fine Arts Camp. So, in some ways, every project that I've been invited to, I I have been putting in Indigenous language and land acknowledgement into every part. And then this was a, a mural um, in the Girdwood Town Square they have where that the 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 uh, center park is. And so we had all the kids like draw little plants on the land. So we went out and did like little plant drawings and then I digitized them and we uh, we uh, took a projector, projected their images so they could paint them. And then I painted Dentalium in the, in this, in the um, sky, you know, the yellow sky with the, the land acknowledgement uh, that was created by Helen Dick and my aunt Sandra Shaganoff Stewart. Um, let's see, what else do we got? Can you go to the next one? So th this was part of uh, a little zine that I've been working on um, the past couple of years using uh, indigenous languages uh, from the place that this location is. This is uh, a Klutna Lake in, in English, but it's, it means uh, Induvena, which is a plural objects lake. Um, for the Denina people, a really important uh, sacred spot. Um, these are just little ink drawings that I started doing, but, but I wondered too, like if you took these really iconic parts of, you know, um, the Kayakak or, or Anchorage and, you know, 
only used indigenous language like what 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 does that mean and where do we see that you know and and I go back and forth between using indigenous language you know solely but then also using English you know and and when is it appropriate to 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 mix the two to keep them completely separate you know and I think that it's it's all it's all you know um contextual in different situations but yeah and then this was actually the kind of first sort of signage project I did I started doing um place name sign and land acknowledgement signed and just kind of like statement signs uh in Anchorage with my friends this is uh the, you know the 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 talented wonderful beautiful Ruth Miller um you know in at her home uh so painted Dagoyakak an Anchorage sign um and uh this is kind of how I envision our signage project happening is so when I come visit this weekend, uh, we'll be taking some photos of your signs with you in front of your homes. So in some ways, you know, these signs become an installation and the whole gallery space is, is Homer, you know, or in this case, Anchorage. And I think that, um, particularly in times when we can't be together in the same way that we could before, <laughs> this feels, feels good because it's, it's a way to sort of make a statement from afar and, but also it's a very human statement to, you know, signs of gratefulness and such. Um, and then of course, this is, this is Benel. Uh, this is a little drawing I did before I started the series of land acknowledgement work um, with Asia, Benel, and, you know, it's, it's been very uh, uplifting and exciting. Um, you know, and, and Asia, there was something you said too before uh, you asked this question that I probably didn't answer, um, but you said something about like how this work is rooted in, in restorative justice and self-discovery. And I think that, I think that it's such a true statement um, because I almost feel like you can't really start work in allyship in land acknowledgement, in in these these forms of inclusivity, diversity, you know, um, justice work without without really uh, turning it towards self discovery and really turning it towards who you are as a person, you know, you really need to know um, why it is you want to do these things and why it is you want to investigate uh, this kind of justice work. And I think that they feed each other because, you know, while you start doing work in justice and really turning, you know, um, your work towards that, that vein, I think that it kind of feeds into who you discover your, as yourself as a person, and vice versa. I think it's just kind of like a circular thing. The more you're starting to look for, you know, restorative justice work, I think you learn a little bit more about yourself and a little bit more about maybe what you don't know, what you do know, and what you need to continue learning. And then it's just, it's just something that's like self-perpetuating, I think. And um, I think that it's a, a really important, you know, part of this work is, is that circle, you know, is like always checking yourself and, you know, um, always just moving forward and, you know, keep on rolling along I guess in a circle <laughs> but um yeah I think that's 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 what I I have to say about that um thanks Janan. Thank, you. thank you Melissa Janan we're now looking at a beautiful image painted by Brianna Lee and Brianna's on um Benel's staff and I actually I would like to say that she's been a tremendous inspiration in this work as well because early on as we started talking about this work, Brianna, you shared the um, process of um, restorative justice that began in Minneapolis with Bidet Makaska. And I wondered, as we look at your images, if you might share something of your process and story. Sure, yeah. Um, I, I also made this sign with my five-year-old daughter, <laughs> um, which was really a fun process as well. But. Um, Starting back what Asia was talking about um, with, uh, you know, in, in Minneapolis where I'm from, um, kind of witnessing and, and growing up in, around uh, Lake Calhoun, which it was previously called, um, 
um, watching the process of, you know, the indigenous people actually um, doing, they, uh, Kate Bean was sort of the leader behind this project and many others, but um, seeing the process of actually renaming something to its original name, which is, um, as Asia said, Lake Bede Makaska, um, which means Lake White Earth or um, Lake White Bank. Um, I had been gone from Minneapolis for um, probably eight years. And when I went back, it had been changed. And to to visit this place that I, you know, as a child, I mean, I I would ride my bike around the lake sometimes five times a day. Like it was just, it was a very um, place we always hung out and played. And, um, and going back and seeing the different signs and um, seeing all the work by all the different um, Dakota and Lakota artists that um, put around the lake. There's there's words, you know, in the cement sidewalks, uh, original names of animals and um, different plants. I mean, it, they just, the beauty and um, the effort put into um, giving back, I guess, that place to the indigenous people in a sense, um, it felt different when I went back to see that. It felt different when I walked on that path. It, and it, it was kind of shocking for me as like an adult, like I felt like, why didn't I know, <laughs> like, why didn't I know this? You know, why am I just learning this now? Um, it made me sad. It also brought me so much joy that um, this place, you know, was given back essentially. So that was really powerful. Um, and, um, you know, for me doing this work, um, you know, these are sort of like small little actions, um, starting, you know, sitting down and creating something and thinking about what you want to say. Um, for me, it really starts like what um, you all were talking about. Like it starts with ourselves. It starts with this foundation of who we are. Why are, why are we here? Um, you know, I, I, you know, I come from like my family lineage, like I don't know a lot about where my family came from. I know a little bit about one side, but it wasn't because of like slavery or um, colonialism didn't affect my family. It's just because that information was not passed down. And it's so strange, like looking back, I'm like, why don't I know anything about my great grandfather? Why don't I know where um, you know, these people came from. And there's not a lot of people I can go to to ask those questions. So for me, being here now, it's like starting sort of over and building culture, because I feel like there's a lot of lost culture. Um, and this work for me is, um, it's really about um, building this culture that will then be more inclusive, and it will be more respectful. And I think we're living in such times where, um, we're seeing a lot of disrespect between people. Um, and this is just starting at that foundation, which will hopefully have this ripple effect onto our children, onto our friends. Um, this sign, I drive by this sign every day on my way to town and, and it bothers me <laughs> um, because I, it, it represents, it doesn't represent people. It represents, you know, taking from and this ex kind of this extractive culture. And I feel like I would love someday, you know, to drive into Homer and to see something that um, really represents all people. And, you know, you could still talk about fishing on there if you wanted to, but um, I think that could be a powerful place to do some work together as a community up there. Thank you, Bree. And, and this, this sign was actually created by Emily Cobble who just graduated from high school here in Homer a couple years ago. Um, this was created in, in Melissa's um, workshop. And we do have another of your signs, which I just want to acknowledge these beautiful signs created by Emily, who wasn't able to join us today. But imagine if you saw something like that as you came over Baycrest. And here we have Rika's beautiful sign. Um, unmute, dear. Well, um, I'm just going to start with just, 
you know, I come from a white colonistic society where development um, of more and bigger seems to be better. That's, that's the MO. And I think the way that colonists have named things after people has detached us from the land. We don't know about the land. We just hear words like like Homer. I mean, for God's sakes, the name Homer, named after some con man, um, is, is just amazing to me how place names have detached us from the land. And what draws me to this project is the deep respect for indigenous cultures from thousands and thousands of years ago and that connection to land and how place names are from that land. What is even names of months, everything is, is connected to land. And I'm, I too feel so connected to land. I studied landscape architecture in college. And my reason for that was to bring the human developed world more akin to a sp site specific, wherever development was in a certain place to integrate it more rather than stomping down on it. Um, so a, a project that I've been working on, John and I have been working on for the last 20 years is, and Asia, you may have that photo of the overview, um, of the Beluga wetland system. And it is named Beluga Slough, Beluga Lake and all that. And I think that that comes from the fact that Beluga used to come into that water body to feed on fish. And Clem Tillian verifies that, that Beluga were seen all the time. And it tells me that fish, specifically salmon, used to run up that before white colonizers, colonizers um, decided to build an airport runway there and then to build a road across that dammed that road. And so my sign is I would like to place right where that road is and dams Beluga Lake now. And there's some, um, I don't know what you call it, equipment or machinery, but it controls the intake and outtake of Beluga Lake. And I want to post this metal sign right there saying and thanking the peoples that stewarded this land for thousands and thousands of years. There used to be salmon running up here. Um, and even in our own yard, when we lost all the big spruce trees after, um, after in the 90s to the spruce bark beetle. Um, I what rushed in, everybody else filled their land in or planted lawns or did whatever they did. And I, there's a, a very aggressive grass, which is good for headlands for salmon. It's called Calamagrostis canadensis. It's, we call it blue joint grass, but it is extremely aggressive and nothing else can grow in it when it invades. And I held that back and um, it's allowed all this native vegetation that once existed on our land before the trees died. And now we have high bush and low bush cranberries growing there, high bush and low bush blueberry, crowberries, nagoon berries. And it's just so, it's sort of like my land sculpture project. And where we are, it connects the beach and that whole ecosystem up into the beluga wetland system. So it is this connector point. And I just hope to be a person that brings back the landscape um, that was to a limited degree um, uh, before it was just completely altered. And in my interest about Beluga wetlands and the slough and all that. I've come to learn through Janet Klein um, the history of the road that connects 
onto the spit. And the gruesome work that colonizers did making that connection road, I mean, they literally filled the mudflats with truckload after truckload of cut trees to build this cribbing and then fill it with mud and to make this very mud food sustaining environment into completely altering it. And so um, that, and I don't know, Asia, if you've got that, I sent a picture of the- I should have put it in this. Oh, okay. Okay. And so it's just a picture of this altered landscape and really what a group of us are really trying to, what we're trying to do is stitch real estate back into a landscape. And the colonizers came and just chopped it all up with these arbitrary straight lines and these tiny little lots all through the wetlands. Um, and we are now slowly acquiring piece by piece and stitching it back into a landscape and hope to at least connect it all because the best way for nature to heal itself is to be connected to herself. And my biggest respect for indigenous ways is their connection to land and their understanding that they are part of it. They, it's all one and that we're all related, human and non-human. We're all one family. And that's so, so important to me. So there you go. Thank you for letting me be a part of this. It's deeply meaningful for me. And the work that you're doing is so impressive and incredible um, to think that you know, you pour so much into Benel into your art making, but there's this whole parallel practice of earth stewardship and now it's all really connected. And the show that you have opening today at Benel truly expresses that. Well, thank you. Thank you. This is a piece I want to return to is Image Out of Order again by Brianna Lee. And um, I just want to acknowledge this gorgeous painting. I, I did not make that. No. Oh. Am I getting mixed up? It's beautiful. Is that yours, Melissa? Okay, that might be Adele's. I'm. I guess I'm. I'm not <laughs> ignorant here, but it's a really beautiful piece. I'll need to find out who made it. It's delightful. I yeah, think, it's really nice. <laughs> yeah, I think maybe um, one of the Benel folk made it. Argent. Here's a gorgeous piece that you just shared with us. Would you like to speak about this? I think you might need to unmute. There you go. Sure. Um, hello, I'm, I'm Arjun Gwaznikov. I think most people who are here know who I am. Um, I was also a participant of this project. Um, I made this, um, uh, I guess you can call it a sign. It's more of a artistic version of a sign uh, because some of my motivations were um, first I had to think about what this project truly means because I am from a place and a culture that is not very um, not very versed in the world of what um, a non blended culture looks like or feels like. There's not a lot of interest in traditional names. There's not a lot of interest in um, anything that has to do with more of the abstract expressions. Um, there is an awful lot of interest in ecological properties. So I wanted to make something that was kind of a bridge between those two ideas. And one of the things that I was really excited by learning was uh, a project that Rika had worked on um, concerning um, ecological connections and, and art in, through a multidisciplinary event hosted by the Catchment Bay Research Reserve. And that was really um, eye-opening for me because I didn't realize a lot of the connections that some of the 
uh, indigenous vegetation has to a lot of these river systems. So I wanted to pay tribute to that um, through an, an alder leaf. Um, and the words that I wrote are, uh, the, it's my written version of Denina. I, it, I take a lot of creative license with it. I've been working on that project for a few years now. Um, it says, Keshtu Kidla Nechiltana, and that means um, respect for alders. And uh, Nechiltana means, it's like an ethnonym of our local people here, is, is people of Nanilchik, or it could be also called people of the, of the, the Birch Lodge. Um, and what that represents in that, in that main river system that I happen to live by is the connection of those unseen relationships, the ones that people are still learning about and how important they are. Um, and I drew, <laughs> I will paint it. There's a, a figure of a porcupine. Um, and I just put that there because I thought uh, it's this time of year when I see them a whole bunch and they are very resilient animals. And I thought, boy, there's a real similarity between those and a lot of these ideas about um, vegetation because people don't really, maybe they don't notice them so much, but they are very um, tough and <laughs> very, very resilient. And if, if, if I could um, go back a little bit, it's very, interesting for me, um, just as somebody who is as much a participant um, as a teacher, because during our, uh, uh, when we were making these signs at our event a couple of weeks ago, I was exhausted <laughs> because it seemed, and, and Melissa is absolutely right, it takes a lot of time and patience to be uh, a teacher and it's really difficult to do that when you are also somebody that is still very involved in the learning aspect. And what would be surprising for people to know is there are many people who are my own relatives and um, within my close tribal community that would that still don't even know what our traditional language or or dialects or history even is, they would still use words like Indian or Eskimo <laughs> very um, broadly. And it's very interesting. So it's kind of like, I'm coming from a place of, I need to find out what's deeper. It's because, so when people approach me and they ask me, what's the name of this animal? What's the name of this place? What's the name of this plant? I'm not, I, I can certainly help with that, but to me, that's not important. To me, what's important is the abstract values. And in the word uh, dukidla, uh, dukidla is a, a suffix that you use for things that are imbued with respect. And that's something, that's a feature that we don't really have in English. We don't have a, a suffix that's an honorific in that way. And so I was really, um, that just kind of hit in my brain. And I think it's those little tiny things that are found in, in not just language, but, but also in what you learn through your family history, that's important. And so the part of land acknowledgement I really enjoy is the meeting people and the, and the connections and the one-on-one -on -one discussion, because you're going to learn so much more. And for example, the thing that I think is really um, fascinating is, and I don't mean to belittle it because I know it comes from a very honest and, and well-meaning place, but uh, again, I hear more about, oh, wouldn't it be nice if we could use this name instead or this name instead? But for me, the names aren't interchangeable. I think that what, um, and just speaking in the case of Homer, but you can also talk about other places similarly, is it's it's made its own spirit, I I believe, and the you can look at different names, and we always talk about what's the name for this. The spit has a separate name. This speech might have a different name, and we don't know. And and but there's no 
word in any language, indigenous or not, that would really encapsulate what the spirit of Homer is now. And, and I think that's one of the cases that maybe um, could be brought up when Melissa was discussing about what is, when is it appropriate to include um, English? When is it appropriate to just focus on one or the other? And I think that's one of those cases because it's so unique. It's not geographically one for one. Um, and the fact that it was named after a person Maybe, but you also have to look at the flip side where uh, indigenous names may not be named after people, but the people often got their names from those places. So we're really looking at two sides of a window here. It's not, um, it's not a matter of arbitrary labels as much as people think, you know, people are not as and the fact that people are so distant from their culture, um, it can seem that way. It can seem like these are overarching labels that have a lot of authority and when really they, they only somewhat do. And what I really, um, I, I feel for people like Brianna who said that, that they wish they knew more through their own family history and that's not something that is um, a result of any, you know, necessary trauma. It's just kind of the natural progression of how things happened. And and one of the things that modern culture and and it is it has mostly been white culture, but there are people that perpetrate that in in all matters of life. Is is there is a cultural loss, and with with that cultural loss and vacuum, there's no, um, there's no communal uh, spirit. It, it, it's like everybody's value is no longer tied to any central idea. It's your value is tied to what your work or career is. Your value is tied to um, what your present situation is and that's, and, or what your personal characteristics are, especially in this country that has a really big bearing on how, what people perceive your culture to be. And so I, I do really feel like when we talk about the, the trauma of colonization, it's almost a little disingenuous to just say that the indigenous people were the only victims. It's the people and descendants themselves that are also victims in their own way because they have these experiences of they grow up and they realize, wait, why am I in these surroundings? Um, who came before me? Why? You know, I, I want to know more. And then they, they get so far down the line and their history just kind of stops. And unless they do one of those fun little 23andMe tests, <laughs> they're not going to find out that much more. Um, and that's why there's this huge interest in, in genealogy and and all those connections. And, and I see people engage in those um, kind of with the similar attitude towards what I think should be directed toward things like land acknowledgement, because I feel land acknowledgement is more about addressing your present and trying to change the definition of what progress means. Um, people say, we mean, I would like to see all these things go back to the way they were. Um, and it, it can mean anything. It can mean society, it can mean natural features, but they're really, in a way, there really is no going back. You can try to um, mitigate some of the long lasting effects. You can do whatever you want, but there really is no way to actively go backwards and there's no way to legislate um, acceptance and reconciliation. You can make specific actions that address a lot of those topics and instances, but there's no way to legislate that interest. And the, the one last thing I would like to mention is um, last week when we had a discussion with Skywalker Payne about um, the role of, of racism in a lot of our um, just how we perceive the world and how we 
connect to each other. Um, the one thing that I found very coincidental was not only did uh, people say they didn't have enough time to participate in um, actions regarding diversity or inclusion. Um, I found it very coincidental because if I were to ask anybody um, in my tribe or extended family why they never um, uh, learned kind of what I have um, just through my own family lineage and, and interest in, in uh, cultural studies, that's the same thing they say. They say, oh, there's, we don't have any time for it. And so I, I made that, uh, I had that epiphany last week where I thought that is the same exact thing that people say when it comes to um, cultural learning. And so just taking the time is so important and that can mean anything. It, it, it means that it doesn't mean you have to participate in any big initiative or program or, or even talk to anybody else. It just means taking some time. And so I think beyond all that, that's going to be the most important thing going forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Archon. Um, this is the first in a series of um, collaborations that I did with um, Debbie Poor, who um, also made some gorgeous signs that we'll look at. And my thought with this series is um, that it could stand perhaps in the garden alongside Benel, um, intermingling with the pictures of, um, you know, like Brianna Taylor and, and others who have um, been lost due to violence and disrespect for life. Um, these names are ones of the few that I have been learning in this process. And with each, you know, um, new word is, is just a sense of um, a deepening connection and, and an appreciation for um, the stories that uh, I, I want to learn more about, which were, which were missing from my education growing up in Alaska. To hear the name Kajimak and hear the resonance of Ketchumak in that name as a, as a distortion over time, but contains its original essence still is really exciting for me when I just learned it a few weeks ago from Supiak elder Sally Ash, who's been teaching Sukstun, the language of the Supiak people in Nunwalek for over 20 years. And immediately, of course, after that, I just wanted to say, you know, Koyana to Sally, because in sharing these words and teaching them to um, her community, she's showing those folks and others how to care for this land. And as, and, and the same is true for, for Melissa, Joel, Isaac, Argent, who've been teaching us words. Um, I feel really uh, overwhelmed every time I try to say, you know, Shanann. It's like, can I say that? And, uh, and this is why it's important. There's a lot of wisdom in these words. With this slide um, kind of expresses that intersection that happened as Debbie developed her own body of, of uh, work, <laughs> her latest body of work in um, indigenous land acknowledgement. Um, but uh, I have just one more and that was the first one I tried which was a lot of text for one small piece of wood but I was sort of trying to pour everything in it and that's um, an overwhelming proposition. But it was neat after that to realize, well, just, you know, one word and one thought at a, at a time, one place at a time, one site at a time, we can um, build a, 
or tell a fuller story of this place. So I'll pass the, um, the uh, platform to, to Debbie, if you would like to um, talk about, whoops, the signs that you, um, that you created, Debbie. Uh, well, may I say Chinan for this opportunity. It's something that's near and dear to my heart and carries a lot of emotion. Um, my parents moved here from Southern Minnesota and I was born in 1953 in the old Providence Hospital in Anchorage which is right downtown, was right downtown. It was on the bluff. Um, and as we've been talking about this, I realized, wow. So I was born on that bluff. And then when I grew up on my family's homestead at Eagle Rock on the Kenai River, that was a bluff overlooking the river. And now I also live on a bluff and I hadn't put those three bluffs together before until just as we've been talking. But um, when we named our, our, our place here where I live now, we named it Bluff Meridian because I wanted something that spoke to what the land is. And that was my baby, my baby knowledge of this space. Um, so growing up in Kenai on this, this woodsy land, our place was right next to traditional land and it's called Old Eagle Rock. And the person who lived there before I was born was named Sergei Peteroff. And as, as I grew up, uh, one of the most important things to me was that we were berry pickers. That's, that's one way that we interacted with that space. And we walked old game trails and old hiking trails, really ancient trails that, that go down into the moss, maybe almost a foot. And there were um, barabras in that, on that traditional land that are old um evidence of historic homes and there was spring water you know it, it that land is still such a special and precious place to me somehow it taught me how to be connected. You know, it, it wasn't really, I didn't learn that from my family so much, except that we loved being there. And I even, in fact, my parents bringing their culture from Minnesota, um, I, some of the things around me I learned the wrong names for. I learned to call aspen trees poplar trees. And it took me a long time to learn that they are quaking aspen. Um, and we always called the bird the magpie bird, the black and white one with the iridescent green feathers. My father taught us to call it a kingbird. And it took me a long time to learn that it's called a magpie. So it, that's part of what happens when you immigrate. Um, there, there is uh, a lack of, of the old knowledge and you bring old knowledge from somewhere else. I come from a long line of carpenters and teachers and farmers on both sides of my family. 
And so land is important and learning about it is important, but, but this was a new place for my parents and there was a lot of that information that they didn't know. And I was, I was close to old families in Kenai, but, I, but not in the sense of learning what to call things or, yeah, yeah, that was just the one piece, I guess, that we are, I'm sure we picked up more things that I'm not aware of, but, but for instance, at Easter, we make Russian Easter bread. And that was because of growing up in the Kenai community. And because when I was young, it was a village and um, there was a lot of interaction between the different portions of the culture. But I didn't learn in school about the history of that area. Um, I didn't even really learn about the people. I learned about the people through meeting the people. And when I was growing up in Kenai, the background of the people in that community were indigenous. Um, there were Scandinavian fishermen, there were Filipino cannery workers, and some of those families go back generations. It's very interesting to me, what one project that, that I've put a lot of time in on is um, researching the Chinese cannery workers who came to Alaska. They came from the 1830s, 1870s, all throughout that, that time. And then slowly they were kind of replaced by Filipinos and by Japanese workers. Um, and then eventually I think even by uh, Hispanic workers, but they were brought up every season, um, originally on tall ships they came up with the spring tides and they went to every cannery on the coast of Alaska. And if you ever go in to um, the gear shed, they have a wonderful map on their back wall that shows where the canneries were located all along the coast, all along the, the coast of Alaska. And it's fascinating, we, you know, we might think of half a dozen or a dozen or 15 or 20. No, there were hundreds. And so there were thousands of Chinese brought up here. They weren't allowed to marry. And um, they weren't allowed to stay here. They had to very much provide a lot of their own food while they were workers. And so many of them were malnourished. Malnutrition and disease were huge. There was some violence. Um, if, if you comb through the place names in Alaska, you'll find less than a dozen that reflect their presence here. And yet they came for years and years and years, every summer. They came up in usually April and stayed until October. So the ships would come up on the spring tides and go back on the, on the autumn tides and would take the canned salmon, all the summer's pack out to be marketed on the West Coast. When I was talking with one of our nieces about this, she looked at me and she just got very puzzled. She said, why didn't I learn about this in school? And I looked back at her and I said, why didn't I learn about this in school? And she said, but there's no place. There's no place in my mind. There's no room in my mind to include that in my image of this homeland. And I just thought that was um, very poignant. And that's, that's not to detract at all from the indigenous people and how, how we haven't learned about 
the indigenous people of this land. This is a photograph of our front yard, our front gate, and the sign as I put it by the gate. Sustain indigenous knowledge. To me, that includes history. It includes so many things. And I love the point that you've made today that land should be named for land, not for people. People come and go. People, people are, um, they're fallible, they make mistakes. Um, how many times have things been named for a person and then we find out that that person was not somebody who we should hold in such high regard. But we can hold the land in high regard. And Andrika, I, ha I had a thought when I, when I was growing up, um, the beluga would come 11 miles up the Kenai River. They would come after the hooligan and they would come after the herring. And especially in the spring high and low tides mm. and in the autumn, the late autumn high and low tides. Wow. So, so include that bit of information because I know the hooligan run up the Fox River Valley. So it's quite possible that they would, I don't know, it's just kind of interesting. Um, they would come they would come when the when the tides were so low out in front of where i grew up there are two or three islands in the river and and there's a main channel there's a big boulder called eagle rock then there's a second channel and then there's what we call the back channel and that was where the traditional land was it came down to the back channel but in the 90s, there was actually, no, I take that back, in the 80s, the late 80s, no, it was the 90s, excuse me, early 90s, very early. I had an experience where that back channel, low tide, very low water, and we heard this sound, this poof, And we went to see what was going on. And I said, I know that sound, I know that sound, but, and we got down there and there were over 30 beluga whales, all ages, all sizes, and they had cordoned off that back channel so that the hooligan were caught there in that low water. And they were just having a feeding frenzy. They were rolling. It was just like the water was boiling. It was really something to see. So there, I've digressed a little bit, but um, th those are some of the, I think some of the most, oh, the, other, the other, other comment I would like to make is that when I was teaching, we learned that for children to have a word and learn to spell it, to take it into their lexicon, into their own vocabulary, they needed 10 experiences with that word. And certainly the richer and the deeper those experiences would be, the more, the more meaningful, um, the more really wonderful and, and lively that word would be for them. And so this morning, when I couldn't sleep in the middle of the night, I started writing down my experiences of land acknowledgement to see how many encounters I've had. And so far I have had, well, today's conversation is my seventh encounter um, and they stretch back many years, but I, I didn't know that, you know, I had to kind of, kind of, string them like beads on a piece of string 
the first one and then the second one and and it's really fun it's it's like a lineage of my lineage of land acknowledgement and and when i was growing up on that land at eagle rock um there was a sense of this but you know there was no model for me and so that's why i get so emotional about it now Here's the model, here's the avenue, here's the path. Thank you for this. Thank you, Debbie. Well, I guess I'd like to um, circle up today and close and ask um, if, if um, there are closing thoughts, especially from Melissa, who um, is like from she's she's our teacher, and she's you know probably the youngest one in this circle today, <laughs> and it, that's powerful. Well, Hannah Barrett has joined us from Homer, and I think that's perfectly fantastic. I love that you've checked in from Colorado. Is that right? Just the idea that you know you're circling back and continuing to learn gives me tremendous hope. Um, I want to thank you all, especially Melissa. Um, yeah, I just, I just want to say, uh, Chanan will said Keetna, you know, Chanan, and thank you, and do good work, and that's that's what everyone is doing here. You know, it's it's um it's a really strong thing to be vulnerable and to put yourself in a place of, um of humbleness, of admitting to the things that you don't know and moving forward in them, you know? And I think that, that that's really what positive change looks like, you know, is looking at where you are and in your knowledge and, and deepening it, making the active choice to deepen it, to work on things like this um, from such a honest and, um, you know, uh, just just such a truth telling place you know i i feel so honored that um so many people feel moved by this work and it's truly being moved by your own work you know it's like this this has just been the vehicle you know to get there and so i just really appreciate everybody you know i think to some extent everyone in this you know in this zoom room has done their own sort of investigation, you know, of course, you know, throughout their life. But the fact that all of you are wanting to do a bit more with me is, is just a really honoring thing. And um, I am just so humbled. Um, you know, these, these projects, these ideas, they feel so, they feel so, um, they feel so important to me that it's almost, it's, it's hard, but it, it's hard to sort of describe like what, what they, what they actually mean, you know? Um, and I think Argent said something too about, you know, how, you know, colonialism, why it didn't directly affect, you know, myself or, or, or himself. Um, it, it affects us in, in our current sort of like experiences you know, and in our current knowledge and the work that we do, you know, to understand our cultures and to learn about them, you know, through all those difficult things. But I have to say that working with a place like Benel um, makes me feel brave to do so. And, you know, so I just really appreciate Benel. I really appreciate everybody here. I'm going to try not to get emotional <laughs> because, um, it just means a lot. It just means a lot to have, uh, you know, institutional support and community support from, um, you know, folks like all of you, you know, because um, this is work that that very easily nobody could care about, you know, and the fact that uh, you are all willing to do the work um, to care about it is is an important thing, and uh, it is truly work. It is truly work to. Um, to do this, to do this kind of thing. So, Chanan, thank you. 
Thank you. We'll see you tomorrow in Homer. Yep. <laughs> one one o'clock at Vanell. Yes. yes. Until then, everybody. Yes, Take I'll care. see everyone. Everyone, uh, wear your wear your best outfit because <laughs> I I have my camera prepped and ready. <laughs> okay. <laughs> then. All right. If, if I can, can I say one more thing? I want to talk to 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 Debbie. Um, I just want to say that was really nice for you to share. And I'm going to use um, that idea of repetition and, and keeping track of that. I think that's a really powerful thing to do. Um, and, you know, I, I, one of the things that you said that stuck out in my brain, just real quick, was um, about the history of the cannery workers. And if you look at our culture's artifacts from the past 300 years, you'll see that it, they incorporate materials from all cultures. And there's many beaded pieces that use um, empire era Chinese coins. And, and there's, so those connections are, are there and they exist and, and they're, they're valuable. And so I, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Until tomorrow. <laughs> Ahana. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you so Thank much. You. Tomorrow. Bye. See you tomorrow. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thank you.